Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's cooking demonstration. My name is Veronica Nye. I'm an economist with American Farm Bureau Federation, and I'm pretty sure I have the most fun job of all the American Farm Bureau Federation staff at annual meeting because I have been able to be behind the scenes helping some of the chefs for the last couple of days. This morning, it's my pleasure to introduce Dave Zeno. He's the executive chef with the Beef Checkoff. He has a great presentation lined up for you this morning, and I think you're in for a real treat. So help me in uh, welcoming Dave to the stage. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's always nice talking to uh, folks in uh, agriculture because if I was in New York and I had a 9 o'clock presentation, there'd probably be about five people in the audience. No, uh, they, they don't like that. What we're going to do today is this is going to be part uh, a PowerPoint presentation, which is going to set up the demonstration. So uh, you're going to hear me talk, and then uh, we're going to show you uh, the demo. Uh, so when I was going uh, to culinary school, uh, I had the uh, I had really good fortune. I had, was trained by French chefs, uh, Danish, uh, Irish, Italian. So I really got a, a, a strong background in in in, in different cuisines. Uh, but all of these guys had uh, one thing in common. Uh, anyone want to venture a guess what that was? Well, I, it, 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 it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to hear you, but we'll, we'll do the best. The one thing they had in common was they all smoked cigarettes, okay? <laughs> and when you smoke, uh, your, your, your sense of taste uh, is, is diminished uh, to a degree. So the joke was the easiest way to get through uh, a culinary school or a ACF apprenticeship was to have a stick of butter in one pocket and a bouillon cube in the other. Because they would always say it needs more salt, add a little more butter. And, and these do, they do work well. Fat and sodium always is going to have a place in, uh, uh, in cooking, but it doesn't have to be the, uh, the crutch that, uh, that, we, that we leaned on. All right, what's going on with my clicker here, guys? Oh, okay, here we go. Um, and several years ago, the checkoff uh, funded a project called the, uh, the Healthy Beef Cookbook. Uh, and that really was my epiphany into learning that you don't need to lean on fat and sodium to, uh, to get flavor. And at the time uh, of, of this cookbook, we had the opportunity to, uh, to hire another staffer to help us get through. And we had the option of hiring somebody that had a really strong culinary background and somebody that had you know, an okay background but was a registered dietitian. And my vote was for the strong culinary person because we needed to crank out uh, 130 recipes uh, in about six weeks, so we really needed somebody strong. Uh, but I got overruled, and it was probably about the, the best time I've ever been overruled in my life because having that dietitian on staff really helped us. Uh, you know, We wanted to shoot for 15 grams of fat per recipe, so if we were at 18 or 19, she would run the nutritionals, come back in, and then we'd sit there and figure out how can we still make this a delicious recipe uh, without, uh, without you know, going back to the fat and the sodium to, uh, uh, to, to get us there. So, uh, and, you know, if I, I will always want to have a, somebody with a nutrition background uh, on, on, our, on our culinary staff. Okay. All right, so when we think about taste and flavor, uh, they're not the same. Taste are those receptors in our tongue, sweet, salty, sour, bitter, uh, and there's one more. Anyone know what that fifth taste is? I didn't, uh, it, it's umami. Go ahead, shout it out. If you, if I'm gonna, we're going to be interactive here today. Flavor is the combination of taste plus aroma, juiciness, juiciness, mouthfeel, and color, okay? So if you, if you, you take a jelly bean uh, and start chewing on it and keep your nostrils completely shut, the only thing you're going to uh, experience is the taste of sweet. But once you open your nostrils up, you get the flavor of whatever that jelly bean is, uh, grape, cherry, whatever. Now, when we think about uh, fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, in and of themselves, they're not all that flavorful. But when you break them down in their component parts of sugars, amino acids, and fatty acids, that's where all our flavor is coming from. All right, now when we think about the beef animal, uh, flavor goes from front to back. In the front, you've got 
great deep beef flavor in the chuck, uh, a nice ribeye steak, uh, beef short ribs, really, really flavorful. When we move into the middle, we start to mellow out a little more. Uh, a filet, very tender, but you know, it, it really doesn't rock my world. I'd rather have that ribeye or, or something from the chuck. And then when we get over to the round, we have to do things like marinades uh, and rubs to help, uh, help bring that, that flavor out. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the fifth taste, umami. Uh, it was first isolated uh, in 1907 by a Japanese scientist by the name of Dr. Ikeda. And it just sat on the shelf for about 90-some uh, years. Then in the late 90s, researchers from the University of Miami uh, actually isolated the, 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 the taste. The wine industry picked up on it. But in 2001, uh, the Chekhov did some research on it. And I think beef has really been a, a leader in speaking to the, uh, to the uh, taste sensation uh, of umami. All right. Now, when we talk about umami, uh, we, well, when we talk about taste, we think of sweet and salty as being the good taste. You know, a, a nice piece of cake, uh, a pretzel and a beer. You know, those, those, those are good tastes, all right? When we think about the bad tastes, uh, bitter and sour. Uh, most natural toxins are, are bitter. Uh, sour, you know, you, you grab milk out of the refrigerator, it's sour, you know for sure that uh, it, it, it's not good. What umami does is, is that it, it minimizes the, the negative tastes and maximizes the positive tastes. All right, uh, it comes from three, uh, three natural sources, the foods that contain them, glutamates, the salt of glutamates, glutamites, and nucleotides. Beef contains all three, making it a naturally uh, good source of umami, okay? And it's not one plus one equals two. When you take umami-rich foods, some examples are uh, tomatoes, mushrooms, corn, peas, uh, aged cheeses, uh, Worcestershire sauce, soy sauce, all big umami. So it's almost eight to 10 times the amount of flavor when you combine those foods. I don't know if you all went out to a steakhouse while you're here in Nashville, but you know, think about a nice steak with uh, some blue cheese butter melted on top uh, and a glass of red wine. That's a really an umami experience. And aging, ripening, and fermenting of foods will dramatically increase the umami that has them. So if you look at the chart here, you see a green tomato is gonna have very little umami in it. But as the summer goes along and it ripes on the vine and it gets juicy and it's splitting, that's where all your flavor's at. All right. And again, here are some, uh, here are some uh, examples of uh, umami uh, in action. Uh, and here are just some menu items. Uh, steak, I mentioned blue cheese butter, uh, wild mushroom ragu, good examples of, uh, of umami in action. All right, now, uh, I'm kind of a, uh, even though I cook for a living, I'm kind of a weekend warrior. Uh, I'm from Chicago. We have winter from about September through the middle of June, and then it gets to be about 150 degrees for the time in between. So, uh, so I have time on the weekends. I like to play around in the kitchen and, and just mess around. And uh, I, I, lo I love my pasta. Uh, and tomato sauce is a good, a good uh, vehicle to practice uh, with, with uh, umami, because one, it has umami, uh, and then uh, we're going to list some sauces here. Uh, which one of the sauces do you think is going to boost the umami most, or ingredients is going to boost the umami most uh, in that tomato sauce? Red wine? Vodka. vodka. Who said vodka? Raise your hand. Give me your business card, and I'm going to send you a fun gift from uh, Dave's Culinary Pl Prize Closet. I'll send you two gifts from Dave's Culinary Prize Closet, if you can tell me why it's the vodka. Because you don't care after you drink the vodka. Well, you know what? That's another good answer as well. Um, I, I maybe didn't mention this, but I should have, but potatoes are also very high in umami, OK? Aging, ripening, fermenting of foods will dramatically, dramatically increase the umami compounds. Vodka is distilled from potatoes. It has the highest alcohol content, the longest fermentation process. Therefore, it's going to boost the umami most in the tomato sauce. Now. Uh, it's kind of a trick question because all those ingredients are going to boost the umami. Uh, how many people have fish sauce in their cupboard? Couple? How many people have never worked with fish? Well, for those who have worked with fish sauce, would you agree with me that it's probably the most vile smelling tasting condiment known to man? 
But if used correctly, if used correctly, it will boost the umami uh, in anything that, that you put it in. It's kind of a behind the scenes uh, condiment. You know, if one's good, I'm from the school of thought, if one's good, 10's better. Uh, in this case, 10 would really be, uh, would really be overkill. All right. So let's talk about, now we're going to get into some of the things that we can do to uh, increase flavor. Salsas are a great way to, uh, to increase flavor without uh, going crazy on um, uh, fat and sodium. Uh, they're colorful, they're flavorful, just a, a great way to uh, perk things up. Reductions are another thing that we can do. I'm going to show you a, a quick reduction today uh, with some balsamic vinegar. Uh, the more we reduce it down, the more intensified the flavor is, uh, and it becomes, it becomes very sweet and syrupy. Aromatic vegetables. If someone handed me a, a, any hunk of meat, I don't care, beef, pork, lamb, and they said you have to braise it, the first thing I would do uh, would run to the refrigerator and get uh, celery, carrots, and onions uh, to, to help boost that flavor. They're all pantry-friendly ingredients, but they really do uh, boost flavor. Uh, drying. Uh, if you took uh, tomatoes and, and, and dried them, shrinking in that flavor again. Mushrooms are... Uh, uh, very good. Uh, we, we tried to find some dried porcini mushrooms yesterday, but we couldn't, and uh, we were in a blazing rainstorm, so you're, you're not going to see that, but uh, uh, dried porcini mushrooms, or any mushroom that's dried, put it in a coffee grinder or a blender, buzz it up, and it makes a really nice, simple rub uh, on a steak. Uh, speaking of rubs, uh, a great way, as we mentioned, those cuts from the round benefit from a little boost in flavor. Rubs will get us there. Uh, marinades, we marinate for two reasons, one for tenderness and one for flavor. Uh, our less tender cuts from the chuck and round benefit from a, uh, a tenderizing marinade. Tenderizing marinades will have things like acids and, en uh, and enzymatic ingredients. Uh, I'm going to show you a real simple one today. And, you know, there are some chefs that want to, you know, empty the closet and put 150 ingredients in a recipe. I'm from the school of thought that if we can lean on uh, prepared ingredients, to help give us a few shortcuts, uh, it works well. Chekhov does a lot of research uh, on millennials, or on, on everything, and right now we're doing some research on millennials, and uh, those in that generation, uh, come up and see me afterwards, because we're going to have to get you guys back into the kitchen. All right, adding heat. Uh, well, obviously, you know, you, you, you don't want to eat raw food, but adding heat helps bring out that umami. Uh, and uh, uh, flavor. Is it done yet? All right. Uh, I'm a medium rare guy. I advocate medium rare beef. I think the flavor develops nicely right in that medium rare rain, uh, range. And if you think of, a, think of a sponge, we dip it into a bucket of water, we pull it out, it's a raw steak. Uh, we squeeze a little more out, it's medium rare. Squeeze a little more water out, it's medium. Uh, we lay that sponge out in the hot Tennessee sun in the middle of July, it dries out, that's well done. Uh, not a really, uh, a really good beef eating experience, and I know we've got all medium rare eaters out here, so I'm not even going to ask the question how you, how you like your, your steaks done. Now for ground beef, we always want to go up to 160 degrees, which is medium, because we know at 160, uh, E. coli 0157H7 is eliminated, uh, and that uh, is critical. Uh, you can see these slides better than I do because of the lights, but you can see up top we've got that nice medium rare. Medium is a little more picture framed, uh, and well done is pretty well dried out. Uh, anyone here familiar with uh, Anthony Bourdain? Uh, he's a chef. Uh, of course, you're, you're the one who got the vodka question right. He wrote a book called uh, Kitchen Confidential, uh, and the, the book is basically talks about the things that go on in the restaurant industry that we as consumers don't want to know are happening. And he was telling the story um, about he was working in a high-end steakhouse in New York, and when someone would come in and order a, a steak well done, they would just go into the walk-in and pull out any old hunk of beef and throw it on the grill because they figured if someone's coming to New York, paying New York prices for beef, and orders it well done, probably really isn't a steak connoisseur. Uh, he also mentioned in the book, never eat in a restaurant that advertises cheap sushi. Um, and there's a few other ones, but those are the G-rated ones. If you read the book, there's R and X-rated things that go on as well. But it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Maybe I'll save those for the 11 o'clock crew. Okay. Now, this was uh, work done by Texas A&M, and it shows 
uh, again, how pellet, uh, the endpoint temperature has a higher degree on pelletability than a USDA quality grade. And as we crisscross between choice and select, right at that point, the eating experience is going to be very similar. But if we took a select grade steak, which has less marbling, and cook it for a longer period of time, we're pulling more and more moisture out of it. Uh, the chemical composition of all meat is 72% water, 20% protein, 7% fat, 1% minerals. So basically what we're doing is, is that we're, we're, when we cook, we're really managing um, uh, uh, the water content. All right, now, back in 2002, and we've repeated this study three times, uh, and we asked consumers how they liked it. And back in 2002, I call this, it's the David Breaks My Heart slide, all right? Because 71% liked their burgers in that medium range or above, which that makes me happy. That actually didn't break my heart. Um, I can't see the number, but um, in the medium rare range, I think it, was, it looks like 40-something percent, but the well done range, 54%. That's why I call it, it was the David, it, it breaks my heart slide. Uh, people ask me, why do you think that is? Well, my mother, God rest her soul, was the greatest cook in the world, okay? Always, you know, great meals, great meals, great meals. But it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I realized that pork chops didn't have to be crispy to be good. I mean, she'd cook them, she'd cook them, she'd cook them a little more. She'd tie them around to the back of the car, drive them around the block a few more times, cook it a little more. And by the time that pork chop got on my plate, it was this thin little thing. You know, you'd, you'd cut into it, a piece would shoot off, hit my brother in the eye, there'd be a big fight. But she was raised by my grandmother, who was an, another equally good, uh, wonderful cook. But my grandmother grew up in the, uh, in the Depression t uh, era, where you had to cook the tar and feathers out of everything you know, for it to, for it to be safe. Um, I have some friends, and for whatever reason, when I'm traveling and, fr and I can meet some friends for dinner, they always want to take me out to a steakhouse. I, I don't know why. But, uh, but and I'm not arguing, okay? But, um, so I'm in Los Angeles. My friend Greg's wife, Nancy, picks me up at the airport. She says, Dave, we're taking you to uh, Fleming Steakhouse. I said, okay, great. Uh, they make the best well-done filet you're ever going to eat. And I said, well, Nancy, you can have your well-done filet. I'm going to go with my medium rare ribeye. All right, so let's pick the study up again in 2005. Uh, again, we're at that 71%, 41% uh, there, 45% liked it. So we actually went down nine points, uh, which to me was, was a good thing. And then we just did it in 2012. Uh, actually. We, we increased our, our those liking our burgers in that um, uh, medium range. Look at that number over there for medium rare. And we actually went down uh, to, to well done. I've been with the uh, beef industry for uh, 12 years now, so I, I can't say that my demonstrations and talk have, are responsible for that change, but I'm just happy to see it, okay? Uh, other consumers who like their steaks more well done, those living in the south central and southern parts of the U.S., African Americans and Hispanics prefer their steaks a little more well done, and there's one more demographic that likes their steak more well done. Anyone want to venture a guess? No, not farmers. The demographic is in this room today. W women, yes, very good. And I, but I know, as I said before, I know women in this uh, group um, are not uh, well done eaters. This shows us just the, no oops, this one shows it's just another, it's another way of looking at how things have changed uh, from 2002 to, uh, to 2012. All right, we are going to move over into the cooking portion of the, uh, of the, of the uh, presentation. Uh, if you'll give me a second, I'm going to put some plastic gloves on because we're going to be handling uh, some raw meat. Uh, but if I go, and the one thing, once you put plastic gloves on, uh, they're, impossible to, they're impossible to, once you take them off, it's really hard to put another pair back on. So um, if uh, I have to take them off for whatever reason, uh, and then touch product, and then uh, back to raw meat, let's just all be in a circle of trust that I've been washing my hands thoroughly, and we're all good, if that's, if that's fair. All right. First thing we're going to do 
is we are going to make a uh, simple salsa, and don't try this at home, but the oven is not on there. Uh, and again, we eat with our eyes. We like, we like color, and uh, again, salsas are just a great way to incorporate fruits and vegetables in a, really, in a really pleasing manner. And not all fruits pair well with beef, but I've got some mango here, and mango is one of them that does, okay? And beans um, are another great, great um, legumes, beans, uh, are really high in fiber. Beef doesn't have fiber, so whenever I can create a recipe where I can add fiber um, to it, I do. And I usually use black beans, but yesterday I was at the store, and a light bulb went off my head, and I was like, you know, chili beans and chili sauce, all right? I mean, hey, let's add a little flavor to this. So today we're going to add some chili beans uh, to, our, to our salsa, and I think it's going to work just fine. Uh, we've got some uh, red pepper, red bell pepper. So now we've got some uh, brown, some yellow. Uh, then we're going to do some red onions. We're going to get a little purple in there. And I'm a big red onion fan, although those pieces were too big. Um, some people aren't. And again, when you're making things like salsas and uh, dishes, it, you know, be your own chef, be creative. There, there, are, there, is nothing, there are no wrong rules when it comes to cooking, and that's why I ended up in the, uh, uh, you know, on the savory side of, of, of cooking. Uh, when I was in culinary school, uh, I, I went into pastry, and I, I, was, just, uh, I was just a flop. Uh, I, I barely got out. Uh, my, my chef instructor uh, said I would be nothing more than a fish cleaner uh, in life, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong. I actually, my second job out of culinary school, I worked uh, uh, at a seafood restaurant, and one of my jobs was, you know, cleaning fish. So, I mean, he was prophetic, but, you know, uh, th things change. But my point is, in baking, uh, it's, it, it's, it's more science. It's, it's everything in there, pop it in the oven, uh, and, and let, let it uh, go. What I just put in there was a little bit of jalapeno. Uh, I also like cilantro. I know cilantro can be polarizing, but I think it adds a, a, a nice kick. And uh, interesting, the term polarizing, 50% uh, might like it and 50% might not. But to get 50% of anything, I think, you, you know, is, is, is a good start. And lastly, I, I, chucked, uh, I shaved some corn kernels off the cob yesterday, uh, roasted them a little bit just to give us a little bit of flavor. Uh, and there you go. And then what we're going to do is to help this along, we're going to squeeze some lime in there. And what the lime does, lime is acidic, and, and acidic ingredients help bring out flavor. So if you wanted to reach for uh, the salt shaker or a piece of citrus, they're, they're both going to do the same thing, okay? So we're going to squeeze some lime in there and we're going to use our fingers. I, I don't have a spoon. But in any event, I think you can see this. We're going to incorporate this. Now, what we would do is we'd let this sit in the refrigerator to let the acid uh, work with all the other ingredients uh, to, to bring, their, bring their flavors out. So I'm just going to put this back here. And through the magic of television, let me clean my hands real quick. I'm going to turn the stove on. Turn it up to seven. But through the magic of television, here we go. We've got a nice, uh, beautiful uh, strip steak cooked to medium rare with the salsa uh, and some brown rice. Makes a nice, healthy, complete meal. Uh, and as you can see, it was very easy to, uh, to do. Put a lime on there for garnish. All right, now, the next thing we're going to do, and hopefully we're not going to blow up the kitchen, but we are going to uh, 
talk about how aromatics uh, help uh, bring out flavor. And we're at the Kroger yesterday afternoon. I've got some uh, nice short ribs here, uh, boneless short ribs. And these uh, bad boys are really, really flavorful. And they, 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 they have to be cooked uh, over long, slow, moist heat, or dry, yes, moist heat cooking process to bring, to bring out their flavor. That New York strip, we can take it out of the container, we can put it on the grill, boom, 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 it's done in 15 minutes. Braising is a, is kind of a, a, a labor of love process. Uh, and, you know, so think of, of chuck pot roasts, a, a bottom round roast, all benefit from, from braising uh, and aromatics. So we're gonna let this pan heat up, and I think we're getting hot. Uh, but our ingredients here um, are, are, are basic uh, ingredients are what the French call mirepoix, which is two parts onion to one part carrots uh, and one part celery. Uh, we're going to add some tomato paste in there. The, what the tomato paste is going to do is it's going to um, add flavor again through that, uh, through that acid. Okay, we're not ready yet. We're going to turn it up to full blast, and we should, we should get there. We're going to add a little bit of garlic. Uh, our cooking liquid is going to be beef broth. I'm also going to add a little red wine to deglaze the pan, because what happens is, as we brown our beef, there's always going to be some that's going to stick to the bottom of the pan, some brown bits. What the red wine does is it uh, uh, kind of cleanses the pan, pulls the particles out. As the red wine reduces, Again, that, that concentrated flavor uh, really, really comes about. And we're still not there yet. And as I said, we may have to pretend uh, if we get past like 10, 10, 15, we're going to have to go to plan B. Uh, so let's, uh, one more second. All right. And the other thing I'm going to um, add to the pot uh, is this little contraption. Anybody know what this is called? I didn't hear the answer, but I'll tell you anyway. Uh, it's a bouquet garni. Uh, and what it is, is you can't see all the ingredients in here, but it's, it's parsley, thyme, bay leaf, cracked peppercorns. And we put it on a stick of celery uh, it just to use the celery as, as, as a carrier. Now. Um, is anyone a Greek mythology expert in the room? I don't see any hands. All right, good, I can tell this story. Um, the reason why we use, we combine uh, parsley and, and uh, thyme and bay leaf together is because it, 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 the, the herbs balance out. In ancient Greek times, uh, there was this female god and there was this male god. And the male god was just gaga over the female god, okay? And he, you know, would chase her around, he'd wait for her at her house, he'd text her, he'd, you know, Facebook her, he'd email her, he'd tweet her. He would do all this to try to get her attention. She became so frustrated that she turned herself into a bay tree, okay? So we refer to bay leaves as being sad herbs, okay? Now, parsley in the springtime, what comes out of the ground, parsley in time, we refer to those as happy herbs. So when you combine a sad herb with a happy herb, you've got the perfect balance of flavor. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but Chef Larry Smith in culinary school told me that story, and uh, I'm sticking to it. All right, I think our pan is where we need to be, maybe even a little, little past, but there's plenty of room between the front row and me, so. All right, if we hear that sound of the sizzle, that's the sound we want to hear, okay? And that is referred to uh, as the uh, Maillard reaction. And, if, uh, and the Maillard reaction, what happens is amino acids and carbohydrates are caramelizing to form flavors in the beef that aren't intrinsic to the beef itself. Uh, and you see me turning around, looking back here. Uh, if uh, Veronica is anywhere in the uh, immediate area, uh, a pair of tongs would really be handy at this point. But you can see on camera and on film, that, that brown, that's that nice caramelization that we need. And if she's looking for, and again, folks, don't try this at home, because, you know, plastic gloves and hot oil, that's just a great combination.
And if she's looking for the tongs, they would be in the red cooler uh, right back there somewhere. All right, so we got that nice browning. And even though braising is a moist heat cooking process, we still want to brown first to get that, to get that caramelization and that Maillard reaction. And here she is. Give Veronica a big hand. Save Dave's life. Okay, so we're going to put these back down here for just a moment. We'll get that back on the heat. Then we're going to add our carrots, our onions, our celery, a little bit of garlic. You know that if, ten's good, if one's good, ten's better rule? Garlic, it, 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 if one's good, ten's better, at least in my mind. Okay, so we're just going to let these uh, uh, sweat is the official culinary term, but uh, we just want the, the onions to get a little, uh, a little translucent, okay? Now, I had always waited till I had my liquids in before I added my, t my tomato paste in, but a, a chef instructor from the CIA told me to add it first because the acids will release quicker and it'll be more, the, the, the braise will be much more married, so to speak. So we'll add our tomato product in there, get that going. All right. And then uh, let's see, uh, we're going to add a little bit of red wine to the, uh, to the pan. Uh, and one thing when you're working with alcohol and you're cooking with alcohol, never ever pour it directly from the bottle into the pan. Uh, if this was a gas stove, uh, the bottle could slip out. Uh, flame, explosion. So it's always better to put it in a little glass and then pour it in. I'm kind of a loose cannon, so I'm just going to pour right from the bottle. All right. So a little bit, and often asked the question, what kind of wine should I use? Um, and it, it's anything that's palatable to you. Uh, if you've got a 95 Bordeaux that you've got, and you've got it laying down, and you want to save it for a special occasion, do not, do not cook with it. Drink that, enjoy that. Uh, the bottled wine, or the bottled or the uh, screw-off cap wines uh, are just as good. All right. What we'd want to do is we want to cook off that wine, and again, if we have those brown bits, we'll remove from the bottom of the pan. Uh, at this point, uh, we're going to put our beef back in. All right. A clean kitchen is a happy kitchen. Here's our beef broth, but let me wipe my hand off first. And then we're going to add beef broth. If you don't have beef broth, you could just add a little bit of water. Uh, if you had some nice veal stock at home, uh, you could add that as well. And what we want to do is we want to put just enough liquid in there. We don't need to cover it because we're going to uh, cover it with liquid as we do in stewing. We want to get about three quarters or halfway to three quarters up there. And then what we're going to do is cover this. And then in about two and a half to three hours, we take the cover off and we have beautiful fork tender braised beef. So you're free to go. If you want to meet me back here in about two hours, we can take a look at it. Uh, as they say, a, wa a watch pot never boils. All right, the next thing we're going to do uh, is we're going to talk about um, reductions. Uh, and this probably isn't the best pan to do this in, but for a visual, uh, it works pretty well. Uh, when we reduce fruit juices and vinegars, really get great flavor. I worked in a, a four-star restaurant uh, in Chicago in, in the late 90s. And the chef would tell us on Friday nights, boys, don't go out drinking. Uh, we've, got, you know, we've, we've got to turn tables twice tomorrow night. We're going to be extremely busy go home and get some rest, and you know, we'll start at uh, Saturday morning. Well, boys will be boys, and lo and behold, you know, we'd go out for a few beers. And the chef knew this, but he would always look for the guy that had, you know, was the greenest around the gills, uh, and he'd have him do the vinegar reductions, because vinegar is very potent, and when you've got an upset tummy, and you're inhaling potent air, 
uh, it's, it's a quick way to uh, clean yourself out. So again, we're going to pour this in. And if you in the front might be able to pick up on it, but <coughs> it's strong, trust me. And what we would want to do uh, is reduce that down. Uh, and we're going to add a little bit of olive oil to it to help the consistency. Uh, we would cook that down and cook it down uh, and cook it down a little more. Again, if this is on TV, this is one of those trust moments that this never happened. We didn't see that. But again, that's going to take some time. Uh, so through the magic of television, we've got some already reduced uh, in a nice squeeze bottle. And it is really syrupy. It is really good. And it, really brings out, uh, it really brings out the flavor. If somebody wants to come up afterwards and put a little on their finger and taste it, uh, go right ahead. All right. The next thing we're going to do uh, are a couple of rubs. And there are two types of rubs. We have dry rubs and we have paste rubs. The difference between a dry rub and a paste rub is uh, the dry rub uh, doesn't have any liquid to it. A paste rub will have liquid like olive oil uh, or mustard or, or sour cream, uh, something to help uh, carry it. And what I like to use paste rubs on are on roasts because the roast is just sitting in the oven and it's not doing anything. Whereas if you're flipping steaks, you, you run the chance of uh, getting uh, that rub all over, uh, all over your uh, grill grates. So what we're going to do is, and this is, this is elementary, we've got some onion powder. Well, actually an onion wafer now, or a garlic wafer. And I don't know why my garlic is doing that. But uh, then we've got some white pepper. And when you do rubs, it's really whatever, whatever you want. Uh, onion powder, so garlic powder, onion powder, white pepper, from some fresh thyme, or dry thyme, I should say, uh, and a little bit of paprika, okay? And we had mixed these all together. And a nice thing to do if you have uh, uh, a an empty jar of peanut butter, clean it out real good, uh, and make your rubs, and then you can shake them up in there. Uh, to get them to go, uh, to get them to go, uh, and the steak will put the dry rub on. Will be another. Let's just turn this off, because once again, plastic and heat really don't work that well. And the Farm Bureau will never have me back if I blow the place up. But just simply sprinkle it on, on a strip, pat it down. Same on the other side. And again, I talked about those dried mushrooms. Uh, just put them in a blender or a, a coffee grinder, and you've got uh, a, great, a great easy rub. All right. I'm one mixing bowl short, so we're going to have to clean this one out. And yesterday, when I was at the store, I really didn't like the roast that they, that they had in the, uh, in the case, so I didn't get one. But uh, let's pretend this beautiful flat iron steak was a chuck roast, OK? Uh, so this rub here is another easy one. It's cracked black pepper, garlic. Again, if one clove is good, 10 is better. Some fresh parsley, and some Dijon mustard. So we stir this all together. As you can see, it's already kind of, kind of pasting up on us. And if you can't see this, just shout. And then let's pretend this is a, a ribeye roast instead of a, a chuck roast, OK? Because the ribeye roast is just going to sit in a pan. We just spoon it in on both sides put it in the oven, and let, uh, let, nature do its, uh, let nature do its magic. All right, a clean kitchen is a happy kitchen, and we're moving along just fine here. Last thing we're going to do uh, is show you a marinade. 
And usually what I do when I marinate, I usually just take a Ziploc bag uh, and put, uh, put the ingredients right in there. But this particular marinade, and this is a, this is a, a, a round steak, Again, mild flavor when we get back, get back to the round. Uh, but we're going to help it out by um, uh, making a, a simple marinade. And again, when I said I like to keep things simple, we're going to start out with uh, a low-fat uh, vinaigrette. All right, we already have ingredients in there. Plenty of stuff in there already that our friends at Kraft uh, did all the work for. Uh, we're going to do some ground cumin. Do, do, do. And the reason why I'm going to the mixing bowl instead of the bag is because we're adding honey, and honey's kind of viscous. So we want to kind of get it in there and whisk it together to help, to help it out. And lastly, but not leastly, we're going to use a little bit, uh, put a little bit of garlic in there. And I did not forget my whisk. And we'll bring that all together. All right, and then take our marinade. And this is really a two-person job, but we're going to try to do it all by ourselves. Whoa, got it. All right, then what we'd do is we'd squeeze out as much of the um, uh, air as we can, and what I like to do is put this in a, on a cookie sheet, any pan that has just a little ridge on it, just so, unless we didn't seal it perfectly uh, and the juices started coming out, we wouldn't contaminate other foods. Okay, so this was the magic of marinades, and with that, um, uh, I'm out of stuff to do for you. So thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, come on up. I'll be here for a while. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? I can bring you the microphone so, so that uh, Dave can hear you better. No? All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. And let's give Dave... Oh, I'm sorry. It actually is harder to see up there than, than you would think. Dave? Yes, um, ma'am. Did you bring the recipes that you put together? Handouts? Um, I don't, because uh, some of them just came out of here. But we've got a great website called beefitswhatsfordinner.com uh, that has uh, offshoots of these recipes. We've got a mango black bean salsa uh, on that website. We've got uh, the, the marinade I just did is called Simple Southwest Marinade, uh, which is on that site. Uh, the rub I did is called Ranch Rub, uh, which is also on the site. And the braising, uh, that's just kind of a method and technique. But, uh, go, but I, I strongly encourage you, if you want some really, really good beef recipes, uh, visit beef at Switzer dinner dot com. Dave, well, the question was if he will be, if Dave will be doing the same presentation at eleven, and yes, it's the same presentation. So tell your friends to come on down. Dave, just one more question. Yes. How long? You may have said it, and I missed it. How long should we marinate that round steak? That tenderizing marinade? Um, very good question. Um, because round needs a little, a little more love than, let's say, a, a filet, uh, our recommendation is six hours or as long as overnight. So if you're going to have round steak on Tuesday, Monday night, mix it together, put your steak in the refrigerator, and uh, uh, let, it, let it marinate, and it'll be beautiful. Would you please tell me again what your mommy is? Umami is, is a taste. Um, it, just like sweet, salty, sour, and bitter receptors on our tongues, we have umami receptors on, 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 on our tongues as well. Uh, and umami-rich foods combined together uh, create a, a I kind of call it a flavor explosion. Uh, and that's, that's how uh, uh, it, it works. 
And if, it, if that doesn't totally answer your question, uh, I can get you some information that would, would help out uh, as well. All right, if there's no more questions, uh, let's all give Dave a, a big round of applause and thank him for sharing his recipes. Thank you.